actually it's one of the workshops that we were talking about doing since continuous learning because we realized during continuous learning that often when there's creative tasks set as a, as a learning task parents get really nervous about the fact that it has to look a certain way and it has to have a certain standard and it has to look like the sample right so this is a good opportunity then for us to share this whole debate about process versus product and that's a debate that's been going on in the education field for decades so it's going to be interesting to look at some of the theory behind it and then look at the difference between process and product especially when you talk about art so the theory we're going to look at i won't bore you too much with it but we will look at PJ's theory of cognitive development because that links really nicely with what we are going to talk about today we will also look at other ways to foster creativity we look at the serve and return approach which is if you've seen the workshop we did on brain development that was that featured in there as well but that is a, a really important approach to developing creativity but also the connections that the brain make at a very early stage uh, when it comes to creativity just through this approach and then we'll share some questions that you can ask to support that creativity with your child and then we'll have a nice Q&A session at the end as well so save your questions for the end because we will have a time for you to ask questions or just share your experience on this topic when we talk about product art and process art i mean it's you can kind of imply what that means just um, by the title but product art really focuses on the end result and this is often where a teacher gives already made whatever the children needs to make and put that in front of the class and then tell them step by step how to follow the instructions so that the results all then look the same. There's a place for that, but it's not ideal when we think about developing creativity, right? Process art, on the other hand, allows the child to be creative and innovative, and it's all about the process of creation rather than the creation itself. So each piece of art is then unique. And it's based on that child's background and their interest and so forth. Ms. Ratna, I know you have something to add here. Yes. As you might all know already, because your children would have brought some lovely pieces of art back home, that what we do here at EYC doesn't look like what you would typically see a very strongly product-based art where it looks all the same and feels all the same here. Our children are given the creative freedom to do as they like because each one of them have a unique story and have a huge imagination behind that little piece of work, which as grown-ups, we've lost that connection and we feel, oh my God, you know, what, what is this? Can you talk about it? Might look like scribbles or squabbles to you, but it isn't that. There's so much meaning behind it. While children have a huge imagination, over here, sometimes when you're dis describing you know, discussing product and process art, sometimes children do need some kind of inspiration. Now that inspiration doesn't necessarily need to come from a finished product. So if your child would like to draw a tiger and says, mommy, I do not know how to draw a tiger. Can you draw it for me? Or uh, can you show me how to draw it? All the teachers in EYC believe that sometimes children do need inspiration. Now that inspiration doesn't need to come from a beautiful drawing of a tiger. It could be from a small world animal that they might have in their toy cupboard where it's a tiger and or a plushy tiger toy, which they look for, for inspiration. And then you talk about the different features and what might the tiger have. It has two big eyes, it has two pointy ears, some whiskers. So you talk through the whole process and then give them the creative freedom. So here you've given them the inspiration, but the inspiration has not come in a form of a finished, beautiful product, but it has come by a different form, a different media, a different material, where they've taken, drawn upon those features and produced it for you. Right. So sometimes children do need that. A, a product-based approach to art sometimes have unintended side effects. Uh, which may include low engagement and motivation because it's not something they're interested in doing in the first place. Low self-esteem because you show them a product and if they don't live up to that expectation, they might feel that they 
fell short or they don't have the skills to meet that expectation. Whereas for process art, the benefit is just the opposite. It's um, a higher self-esteem, a lot of engagement because for them, it's their piece of art that they are doing. They're more motivated to do it. And because there's no right and wrong way, they are not going to feel that they failed in any way. So the cognitive skills are also enhanced through this process of art. And then speaking of those cognitive skills, that moves us on to the theory that PJ shares. So you might be familiar with this. And those are the stages of cognitive development that PJ identified many, many years ago, and it hasn't really changed. The first stage for us is that sensory with children just it's all about the touch and the smell and the, and, the, and what they see, but they don't really put a lot of meaning to things. The stage that we will focus on is the pre-operational stage, because that's where most of our, all of our children are at, not most of them, right? There's nursery and reception. All of, all of them are at this stage. And that stage typically can be ca characterized as children starting to connect meaning to symbols. A picture means something to them. If they see a McDonald's sign, they know that's McDonald's. So that's when they start making those kind of connections. And then at this stage, they also tend to be very ecocentric that you know, and they struggle to see things from the perspective of others. So like, it's just my way and that's the highway. There's no <laughs> other way. <laughs> and then while they getting better um, with language and the thinking, they still tend to think about things in a very concrete terms. And they also struggle to really differentiate between fantasy and reality, which is the perfect time for them to be creative because they can't do that, right? It just goes in all kinds of directions. Now, the world of these preschoolers is one of imagination and magic. And for many children, their creativity will reach its peak before the age of six. So after which it will begin to decline with the onset of formal schooling. So this is the perfect time to kind of engage with that and make sure because the, if a child has a strong sense of creativity now at this age, it's more likely that it will continue um, further on in their lives. So by the age of three, children have officially entered that pre-operational period. And, the, and this is the hallmark of which um, is the ability to use symbols to represent meaning to, to different things. His fine motor skills are developed enough by three years old that they are able to hold a pencil or a paintbrush and start those first steps towards mark making. So it's a very interesting stage, and this is the stage that we do want to tap in and foster creativity. So let's share some ways in which we can foster creativity with our children. So we have some top tips that we want to share, and then we'll move on. First off, encourage creative problem solving. So ask your child open-ended questions that have no right or wrong answer, and then encourage her to tell you why she thinks as she does. So oh, okay. if you look at this beautiful picture, here is uh, a little boy in my class who had made this lovely house for lizards. Now, how did this whole thing come about? In the morning we came to school, the children spotted a lizard in the classroom. And that sparked the whole conversation saying, where do lizards live? What, how, what do their homes look like? And like we know that lizards currently in a cities like Malaysia, they're literally living up our buildings and our walls. And Sasha said, you know, lizards have really special homes. I, I was like, okay, let's, do you think we should build a home for lizards? And that started this whole conversation of what we are going to build. So he's saying, yes, let's go get blocks. Let's go get our lizards and let's build a home. So here he's built this elaborate house for lizards which we might know while we, we as adults that probably a lizard doesn't live in a home like this. Here, there's a fine line between their imagination and creativity and what is right or wrong. So sometimes when you're talking about non-fictional topics as well, 
while they are at this age, they still have a wild imagination, which might not look like the actual habitat of an animal, but hey ho, they want, he wanted to build this house and we built it. And that was such a huge topic that that house stayed there, hoping that the lizard we found in our classroom would find its way there after we left the classroom. So as much as I wanted to give him that kind of information about what an habitat of a lizard is, I did let him foster his imagination and let it come out in a creative way and saying, okay, here, here's your lizard home. It might not look like the real lizard home, but that's, it's still not wrong. It is still right. And that gave him that ownership that after we all leave, leave, uh, leave uh, the school, it's going to come in and stay the night in my little house. So that kind of imagination and creativity and a real life experience from a real life event, it sparks their imagination and gives them that whole lot of creative freedom to do most all areas of their life. Mm. So we will share with you a list of questions that you can use to support this creativity with your child and one of those is here as an example so it could you could ask something like what could happen if dogs could talk or would you rather have no nose or no eyes and why and then you should accept any answer as enough and then build further on their answers by asking more questions and, and show that you're curious about what they are um, sharing with you The second top tip is invite your child to create. So create opportunities where they can create. Make sure you have recyclable materials in the house that they can use to, to junk model like they do in class. And then also give them a list of things to find. So for example, something that has a color or so find two smooth objects, find four things that smells nice so that they can start that creative process very naturally. Can see a little Susie there with her hands in the yeah. face. <laughs> I would I, here I would like to chip in that if parents really have a creative area in their house, a designated space in the house where the child is allowed creative freedom. And when I mean creative freedom, I, it means that that place is safe enough for your child to, you know, probably for their messy play, for them to kind of explore with resources. And again, like uh, currently, I mean, I know the older parents have visited our classrooms, but for anyone who, who's joined the new, all resources, when it uh, when we say art and creative resources are all in our children's reach. Everything is accessible. Paint bottles, glue, scissors, everything is accessible for them to get. We are not worried about them spilling the paint. We are not worrying about them spilling all the sequences on the floor. Well, if that happens, that is going to again lead on to another kind of the sense of responsibility of tidying it up and you know using things properly so if you can give that little space where all the resources are kept freely for the children to use and you trust them instead of you pouring the paint out for them maybe they can take the paint on their own they can take the glue on their own they have that creative freedom and responsibility of accessing everything on their own, that would go a very long way. And making a little creative trolley or an art trolley with all the resources available would be just the most perfect way to kind of let them go uh, wild with their imagination. So I would strongly suggest that if you all have a dedicated area in the house where the child is allowed that freedom and give them those resources. The next slide is break the rules. Invite your child to do things differently. So that's one of the GI's learning skills as well. So instead of playing a board game by the rules, see if your child can come up with the rules, right? That can, a way to just get that creative juices flowing. Have a picnic in swimsuits in the winter. That's not happening in Malaysia because we don't have winter, but we can have maybe even our scarves in the summer. So see how many different uses your child can come up with for a paper clip, or a paper towel or a paper roll and see what the different uses they can find for those things. So, uh, instead of regular paints, why not mix safe spices with vegetable oil? So you can try things like turmeric, so be careful it stains. It reacts with um, black light, paprika and dill for the smell on watercolor paper. It's thicker, 
but it creates a different texture. You use that on the paper as well. And then add salt to paint or beans to Play-Doh, just to make it a little bit different. And then have your child create an alphabet with ligerish strings, spaghetti noodles or so forth. So there are a lot of different ideas that you can just, there's no limits really to how creative you can get with these kind of things. Yeah, there's no wrong. And, and that really, really helps them. And uh, like Etienne said, that whole entire sensory experience, even when they're in the art area, or even when they're with the messy plate, it just fosters that, you know, the sense of smell, the sense of touch, the sense of sight. It just opens up and wires their brains in such a variety of ways that you might think that it might be a simple painting with a vegetable dye or painting with turmeric, but that has opened so many sensory pathways in their brain that it's extremely vital for their cognitive development and progress. Speaking of messy play, it's important that we allow that space for them to be messy. So like Ms. Ratna said, we don't hide away resources because we want them to be able to explore and yes. feel and touch and smell. Creativity is by definition messy. And the more permission your child has and the more free time they have to do this, the more room they have to explore experimenting. Now, this is an important one is think about how you respond. So if your child made something or they're busy doing something, what are the kind of questions that we ask and what are the kind of responses that we give them? So it's really important here that you emphasize the process and not the product. So there are different ways to do that. And then you ask, for example, you can ask your child to tell you about her creation. So notice what she discovered. For example, I noticed that when you lay it green, you got a darker color. How did you make that color? Did you put red in this? No. I just yellow. And that makes green. Excellent. And I'm thinking of green and white. I'm thinking of green and black. Lovely. I love all the colors on your palette, Emily. You've experimented quite a bit. How did you make this brown? Or gray? And what happens when you mix red and blue together? Um, purple. Oh. If you want to expand on that, that I think it's really good. So this was, this was, I caught it by chance. And this is how things happen in the EYC environment and our classroom. This is because children have access to everything on their own. She was busy. She got the three uh, paints out. She picked her palette. She went and got a piece of paper. She picked the kind of brushes she wanted to use. Uh, she has about three brushes on her paper. One was thick, one was thin, and she wanted to experiment. Now here, I would like to emphasize for parents, sometimes I know as a parent as well, sometimes we think we, uh, if I'm gonna give my child the entire paint pot, they're gonna probably squeeze the whole thing into the palette. Yes, they might do it once, they might do it twice, but here, over time, our children have realized that there's, you know, I just need to squeeze a little. I need to experiment with that color. I need to kind of add it. Now this, she was at this task. Emily was at this task for about 15 minutes when I spotted her and I said, okay, now I'm going to go in. First, I let her do everything on her own and I wanted to go in and question it. And moving on after this, what happens after this clip is she's experimented with all the paint and then she decides She's not going to let the paint go away. She made a beautiful painting for which then she could share with all her friends how she got each color and what did she do to create that color. So now that gave her that avenue to kind of peer teach her uh, friends on how she made those colors. And uh, this is exactly what we mean by a process art. She completely enjoyed it. She, com she enjoyed uh, with different strokes. If you see, she's made a square. She's experimented with different kind of brushes. She made a comparison green to the grass. She tried brown on her own. We've not taught her that. So this is what process-based art looks like where they have complete creative freedom. There's no right, there's no wrong.
here and it was it was just beautiful and now she's coming to do more we are giving her white and black so that, that now she can see the different variations on how she can do the tones of the same color so how can she make from a red to a pink and if she wants to make a darker maroon she may probably needs black so it's just giving them then that avenue to go further and push further in color mixing and toning Brilliant. So now I open to the floor. I'm going to ask parents <laughs> to have a think. Here we've got little Eli, and he made something. So you can see that he was definitely busy in that creative area with some upcycling work. So what kind of questions do you think you'll ask throughout the process? Or even once you see the product, how, what kind of questions will you ask as a parent? Is there anybody who wants to volunteer? There are no wrong questions, guys. <laughs> <laughs> We'll give you the same leniency we give them. <laughs> yes, there are no wrong questions. So like, suppose Alicia makes something, any kind of art. So I always start with, Alicia, it looks interesting to me. What all did you make? Can you please explain me about this? this she explained me a bit about it. Then I can also give her the feedback. Your stroke should be in one direction. But I always listen to her and always appreciate her. The, and then I give her the feedback. This is how it goes with me and Alicia, between me and Alicia. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Because when they come to you with something that they made, they're extremely proud about it. So you have to keep that excitement on and just have that sense of wonder because that's how they come to you. And they're so excited about it. Sometimes, as you know, when we are dealing with creative pieces from a three-year-old it might not look like what you imagine or you might not recognize what it is so it's really important instead of asking them what have you made can you tell me something about you what you made yeah. and then comes the story lend them your ears your ears and listen to whatever they have to say they'll go on about how they made it and can you tell me more and what else did you use what did you use to make this so then it makes them think about the different materials they use the tools they use the process they use so basically you are kind of rewiring again um, their brains and they're going through the whole process yeah. cognitively and mentally with you and that's strengthening the, how they went through the process. Yeah. Now, there, there might be with some children who are ready for it, like I know most of our reception children are and some of our nursery children are as well, where we are at a comfort zone we're asking, is there something that did not work or uh, was there something that you faced? Was there anything that was... A little bit tricky and uh, they might say oh you know the, I couldn't stick the bottle with the glue saying oh then what did you do like how did you solve the problem or I went and got some sticky tape and that worked so saying oh next time we need to remember if we need to stick a bottle maybe a glue won't work well a sticky tape are the same. Mm. here they are going to the whole plan do review system with us where we've reviewed their work we are the review bit and we've kind of given them We've given them feedback, but actually even heard if they've gone through any problems while making their creative piece. When they're really young, probably you won't hear much of that because they, you know, kind of, it's fine. Whatever, if it sticks, it doesn't stick, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But as they grow older and our reception children, they have a vision now. They are older. They want it to look a certain way. So it's lovely to have those conversations with, I know the reception parents, uh, the children are really creative and then saying, okay, did is, was there something that didn't work or is there something I can help you with or is there another tool that might work better and then have those discussions yeah. um, but it's really really important to have those uh, conversations with the children and of course applaud them give them that kind of sense of pride and joy and share it you know if, if, if at this point you would say okay let's take a photograph and share it with your grandparents or let's take a photograph of this and put it up on the wall or you know giving them that sense of pride makes them again extremely liberal to make those choices and uh, that self-confidence is just going to soar this is this is also the age where we develop language and what better way to develop language than through a creative project, product, right? So they've made Absolutely. something. And this is where you want them to be able to use the language to explain it. And if they don't know the language, this is where we give them that language. So we, we yeah. will get onto that in a bit. 
with, with some more concrete examples of how you could do that. But another area of, I mean, if you think about it, a child's brain develops before the age of five, that's when the full brain has developed that they will keep for the rest of their lives as an adult, right? So that by the age of five. And every second, they are like, every second, there are a million new connections made in their brains at this age, millions of new connections, right? And we control those connections as educators and as parents. We are the ones who steer those connections and those, the connections that are made and kept working, those are the ones that will stay um, there, but the ones that we don't use, those are the ones that die off, right? So you are born yeah. with all, all your brain cells before five, you lose them as you after that. You can connect them again. It just takes more effort. But for an, a child at this age, this is where we want to make sure that those connections are there, especially for language development. And then another layer to that that's an important one is emotion. So also not just asking, so what did you draw? What color is it? But asking, how, did, how does it make you feel if you look at this? How does the blue color in the why, why did you use blue for this? And how does that color make you feel? So that they can start also um, to attach their feelings to things. So that's a very important aspect um, of this. All right, so one more picture, we can look at this one as well because it is a good example. Look at these two working really hard at that dragon head that they were used for in their lion dance. So, Ms. Ratna, I know that you said this was total free and open-ended as well, right? Absolutely. There was no one. All we did was saying, okay, it's Lunar New Year time. It's time that we generally look, uh, you know, we have a lion dance this year. We can't have anything because of our situation. Let's have our own lion dance. What do we do? Okay, we make a lion head. Now, for that, of course, because this is so new to some of our children, we watched a lion dance before. We watched it on screen. We said, this is what we need to do. We need to make a head for which we need a box. So on the previous day, we painted the box and that was done. Then all we did was just leave the next day when the box was dry, loads and loads of creative resources. They don't have to be fancy. They don't have to be perfect. It's everything that we have and our EYC cupboard, which was put on those tables in little baskets. And all we did was just left them to it. They came there on their own without any adult. There's only one adult sticking the eye in this picture, but they literally came as and when they chose, came and added their little personal touch, their little bit, and they left. And then we had a beautiful lion head, which was out of their imagination, out of their creativity and their, you know, what they had observed and what a lion head or dragon head looks like. And they came and did it here. It was extremely independent. Everything was theirs. Everything was left to the child to do it. We, there was no adult intervention at all. And we had a lovely line head at the end of the day. I did share this in that brain development um, workshop we did as well. But child and adult um, relationships that are responsive and attentive is crucial for forming those um, connections in the brain at this age. And one way to do that is through this serve and return approach to, to building the brain. So I'm gonna share this video, fingers crossed that it plays as smooth and without too much buffering. You know that you can help build a child's brain? Those are bananas. Everyday interactions can have a big impact on developing brains throughout childhood, starting even before babies can talk. Scientists call this serve and return. Like a game of tennis or ping pong, a child serves by showing an interest in something, and the adult responds in a supportive way. Finding moments throughout the day to do it is easy and fun, and you'll be building strong brains. You can use five steps to practice serve and return with any child. Step one, share the focus. When a child is interested or curious, you can see it. What's this? It's a stroller. Watch this child look at something in a book. Right there. Pointing shows interest. Ooh, cow. So does making a sound, like this child. And mom is paying close attention. See baby moving those little arms and legs and focusing on the ball? That's a serve. The key is paying attention to what the child is noticing. Oh, you like those guys too? Look at grandpa sharing the focus. By noticing serves, you will help build curiosity. 
and you'll strengthen your relationship. Step two, support and encourage. You can return a child's serve by saying a word of encouragement. That's right. Pretty good. Watch Grandpa return this serve Let's by saying thank you. Yeah, thank you. Even a facial. You can return a child's serve by saying a word of encouragement. That's right. Pretty good. Watch Grandpa return this serve Let's by saying thank you. Yeah, thank you. Even a facial expression can encourage a child. Orange. Or emotion, a like this mom dancing. Time. A, a, a. You can also pick up the object that the child is pointing to and bring it closer. We need help to sit her down. Things like helping and playing with the child let them know that their thoughts and feelings are heard and understood. <laughs> Step three, name it. Yeah, the puppy, the puppy. See the windows, the house. When you return a child's serve by naming what they are seeing, doing, or feeling, you make important language connections in their brain. He's got bumps all over him, huh? This brain building happens even before a child can talk or understand your words. You can name anything, a person, a thing, an action, a feeling, or a combination. Clean up, clean up, everybody do your shit. When you name what a child is focused on, you help build understanding of the world around us and what to expect from it. The baby's sitting. Ooh, the baby's sitting in the back seat of the car. You like those? Those are raisins. You have raisins all the time. Naming also gives a child words to use later and shows that words are important to you. Step four, take turns back and forth. Taking turns helps children learn self-control and how to get along with others. Waiting is crucial. When you return a serve, give the child a chance to respond. How are you? I'm good, how are you? Note that the caregiver waits here for the next serve. See this toddler navigating a new adventure? Grandpa is waiting patiently, returning serves by asking okay. questions and then waiting to see what happens next. Yeah. You want to cover him? Yeah. Are you cold? Yeah. Oh, put this over your lap like this, okay? Do you like that? Yeah. Oh. By waiting, you give the child time to develop ideas and build confidence and independence. Step five, practice endings and beginnings. Children signal when they're done or ready to move on to a new activity. Watch how this child shows it's time to start something new. Letting go of a toy signals an ending. Then picking up a new toy signals the next beginning. Play with the giraffe. Sharing the focus is important in this step. Ooh, the big eagle. Because this mom is sharing the focus, she notices when her child is ready to end one activity and begin something new. When you can find these moments for a child to take the lead, Let me try this one. you support the child in exploring their world. Would you like to play with something else? And make more serve and return interactions yeah, possible. Sit there. Serve and return interaction is critical for a child's developing brain. And the best news is that you can do it anytime, anywhere, without any need for toys or technology. Look for small opportunities throughout the day like while you're making a snack or while you're grocery shopping. What matters most is that you're doing each of these five steps. Notice the serve and share the child's focus of attention. Return the serve by supporting and encouraging. Name it, take turns going back and forth, and practice endings and beginnings. Serve and return interactions make everyday moments fun and become second nature with practice. Try practicing with a child today. All right, that's something I shared with the assistant teachers on Friday in our
training session again. We did it before because I think it's such an important aspect of building a child's brain and what better opportunities than through their creative work, right? Ms. Ratna, do you want to share some of these fantastic displays? Yes, and coming back to what, um, coming back to their creative freedom. Yes, celebrating, like I said, goes a long, long way uh, for children. Every display in our classrooms and our environment looks is purely child's work, inspired absolutely by themselves. If you see all that, the, the walls are filled with open-ended art, things that they've done on the easel on their own, you see none of them look the same. If you look at this display of the happy faces, this is the one that they did a self portrait of themselves when they started nursery. And they all look different. They all look very unique in their own special ways. Yes, you might see a whole array of different kind of features, where, uh, different stages where children are only kind of drawing using circles, some of them are drawing features, some of them have, you know, their bodies drawn and lots of details, but that's all right. Every child has a different age and stage at which they develop. And if it doesn't look the same, but for them, it means the same, that is the most important. As long as they say that is their face and if they've given meaning to the marks that they've made, that's what we look at. And that's what we need to foster at home. One thing that I would like to remind parents would be that the first thing that you need to get rid of if you have in your in your household is an eraser or a, any sort of duster or anything where children say, oh, this is a mistake and there's, let, let me erase it. That, that concept doesn't need to be in a three-year-old's mind or a four-year-old or a five-year-old's mind. It, that comes much later when they start refining their work. But at this stage, when it's so exploratory and I mean, where children are just purely exploring, there are no mistakes. So please do not give them, do not model with an eraser when you are drawing or you are doing something stay away from using an eraser, make do with what they're doing. Because sometimes children, that kind of brings their self-esteem and their self-confidence down. When it doesn't look the same, they start erasing things and saying, no, 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 that, that's not right. Let me erase, let me erase. And, and if you can get rid of the eraser, even while they're writing, even if it doesn't spell, you know, reception children are beginning to write words and simple sentences, even if it doesn't look the same, it doesn't sound the same, it's absolutely fine. They can write it again, but please do not encourage them to erase. That kind of has a very strong impact developmentally and psychologically. So here you are, you'll see everything. Everything just looks beautiful and in their own special way. Yeah. And that's how we celebrate our children's work. Even if it's there's no right, there's no wrong. Yeah, I think it's the big difference is in, in reception, we, we're starting to introduce, when we give that kind of feedback, we want them to edit, or we want them to improve on something that they've done we have introduced a process called plan do and review so you see now at the reception age it's, it's, it's when they they are at a stage where they can make decisions on what, what they want to do they're not that easily um, drawn into activities that they're not 100 percent interested in it anymore so if they were expected to do something they would very easily quickly do it and then come back to you and say i'm done so the strategy for us is to say okay Let's look at this again. Now I want you to go back and plan, then do and review it. So if they go through that process, they get used to the process of editing. So or they quickly draw a picture, but you, can, you know that they didn't put all the effort into that that you wanted them to put into it. So then we say, okay, let's go back. Let's plan what you're going to do. So first plan it, then you do it. And then the next day is look at it again. Are we happy with this? Is there something we can do better? Is there something we can improve? What if we did this or did that? Would that make it uh, even better? That brings us to the end of our babbling. So if there's anybody that would like to share any of your experiences, or if you have a question to ask, this would be the time. Just happy with the information. I will make sure that all the information, these slides, I will upload to the parent portal, so it will be available. 
And then also there were some articles and things of really interesting um, information that I will also make sure that that's on the parent portal as well for you to access. And then any parent who missed out on this, you can let them know that they can also go back and, and view that. The next parent workshop is, I think, in two weeks' time. And that will be Miss Natalie and Miss Kate also doing a fantastic workshop on some ideas on how to play purposely with your kit, maybe during the Easter holidays. But it's all about purposeful play. So it's a, another workshop to, to look out for. So thank you for your time. Miss Ratna, thank you for all your ideas. Thank you. Thank you all. See you around. Thank you so much. Bye. Have a good day. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, bye, bye. Bye, bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Etienne. Thank you. Take care. Ciao, ciao.